Hello and welcome to Experience Weekly Data Talk, a show featuring some of the smartest people working in data science today. Today we're talking with Nadi Bremer. I said her last name wrong. Uh, Nadi studied astronomy at Leading University and the University of California, Berkeley. She's our very first astronomer on Data Talk. So this is a very special episode. Uh, she also specialized in cosmology while she was in graduate school. Uh, Nadia, I'm sorry, Nadi has done, and I'm going to mess up your name and I apologize. <laughs> she has won countless data visualization awards, including the best individual award from the Information is Beautiful Awards uh, in 2017, last year. She's also the winner of the Urbanization Challenge from the World Bank and Visualizing.org and countless others. You definitely got to check out her blog, which I'll put the URL up in a minute. And uh, her data visualizations have appeared all over the place, including the, Walsh, uh, the Washington Post, Scientific American, Wired, The Atlantic, Fast Company, and many others. Today, we're talking all about how to create great data visualizations. And it's an honor to have Nadi as our guest. Nadi, welcome to Data Thank Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me put up your name on the screen here. Um, so, Nidhi, we like to always ask our guests um, kind of like what was your path to working in data science? Can you kind of share with us your journey? Yeah. So, like you said, I started out as an astronomer and at the at the end of my sort of the, the, the point where I needed to decide if I wanted to continue, I figured out that that was not really what I wanted to. It was I wanted something more dynamic and more, uh, I guess, back down uh, down to earth <laughs> down to earth around. literally <laughs> and uh, I, I i did everything i did in-house days with banks with retails with fast moving consumer goods uh but i also came into contact with consulting and so i signed up for a business course with deloitte because it, it went to barcelona so i was like why not uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually with the strategy department um and while i was there um the business intelligence department came over and they told me, well, we're actually starting up an analytics department and we think that uh, maybe that could be something for you. So they, they told me what it was about. And I thought, well, that's, that's even better. That's doing, that's making uh, like intelligent decisions based on data uh, and still being able to sort of analyze the data and doing things with that instead of no longer about the stars, but now about, you know, what people buy or the mortgages that people have. So it really appealed to me. And that's sort of how I then got started with Deloitte as a data scientist when they were, that was at the start of 2000, no, mid 2011, I think. Yeah. And what was that experience like? Like your first job out of college, you've been working in academia, studying stars, and now you are working with data. Tell, tell us about that transition. Yeah. So it was, I'd been working uh, and programming uh, during astronomy. Uh, I mean, working with data and programming it uh, during astronomy as well, because I, I was more on the theoretical side. So I was working with simulations and analyzing the data there. But the difference, I guess, that came when I went to Deloitte was I was twofold. It was that um, the first few weeks, I just brushed up all of my machine learning knowledge. I read papers about support vector machines and self-organizing maps and whatnot. Um, and because it, when I started out, you're just, you're the new kid and um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't really start on a project. So at least I got the time there, but also the fact that I was going to the clients and that you have to be uh, presentable to the clients and um, just the team dynamic. I liked a lot the, the fact that you were in a small team, usually three or four people of Deloitte within the big clients company that sort of made it make you knit together very fast and become really mm. a team but that team would change every few months and that's something i liked as well it's that every few months i would have a completely different setup of people that i would work very very closely with well that's that's very cool because you see how flexible you are because sometimes people get very comfortable with teams and then when people leave it can be very hard to adjust but the fact that you're like you enjoy working with different people um that, that's wonderful so tell us about, I mean, you've won countless awards for your data visualizations. You're published all over um, doing amazing work. Can you kind of tell us your, your process for, you know, wrangling the data 
and then helping to figure out what that story is going to be? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, the first thing I need to know or I need to figure out is the question or the goal. So what does this data have to tell? What should people learn from this data or should it have a goal? Like should people be convinced and, and sign a petition, for example? Uh, and once I know the story or I know the angle that usually comes from either the clients, they tell me this, or if uh, they don't quite know it yet, I just go through R and I make all kinds of plots and together with some of the you know initial thoughts that the client might have because they are experts on that data. Uh, I try and find the story. Uh, and with that goal, I can then go into figuring out what kind of uh, visual representation would would sort of show that in a most effective but also interesting way. And for that, it's it's a combination of, at least that's what I found, it's a combination of experience. So having made hundreds, uh, maybe even thousands of visualizations in the past from super, super simple ones to, to more advanced ones and sort of knowing what, what kind of works well. Uh, but I also keep, um, I keep Pinterest boards of the things I find inspirational uh, mm with data visualization. So I have a Pinterest board on radial ones. I have one that's uh, about geo and, and, and so on. And I, before I start on a, one of the bigger projects, I look through that to get inspired to just sort of have a collection of possible options in my mind. And then I start drawing on just plain paper and trying to see what sort of sticks and what I think could work for this and try and make at least two or three different versions because it's typically not the first one you come up with that you think would be the best one in the end. So I try and force myself to make a few few different ones. Yeah. You know, it, it must be hard when you get really attached to a certain visualization and maybe your client is like, mm, try again. Yeah, that is true. It's That's also why I start out with just sketching on plain paper. And when mm. I, um, I, I present the findings back to the client, it's still still on paper, although I might've made it a little bit better. Uh, a little bit more like um, a little bit more professional, but still sketch. So it's, it's rough. Uh, and then, then I'm fine with whatever they choose. Typically I, I might have a preference and I can tell them the preference, but they might choose something else, but I've had it now once that we were already in developing. So already making visualizations with D3 and having spent um, several hours on it that the client felt well, this shape is not portray is, is, displaying a, a political statement that they weren't didn't want to have well, maybe not political but um, it was giving sort of an extra effect that they that, that and the data was kind of sensitive so they needed to be extra extra sure that that would not happen so I then I just redesigned it but that only happened uh, once now typically when uh, after the design phase clients sort of understand you know there they have made their choice and then nothing major happens afterwards. So Nadi, you you start with a goal, a question that you want to answer. You begin to dig through all this messy data to find the story. Have there been have there ever been times where, as you're going through the data, you're uncovering another story that the data is telling you that you relay back to the client? Oh, you mean that it's uh, a different conclusion that they might yeah. have thought it would be? Yeah. Um. Let's see. I think it might have, it probably happened during during the first years when I was still at Deloitte. I'm not quite sure if it happened recently though, because then the clients, they, they, they hire me specifically for the visualization of the data instead of the data analysis. So I do, I do less of the analysis these days. Um, but I think that happened. I, I mean, I, there are often the client has hypotheses and you try and investigate that, but that might not be there, but what we typically did is that you have to make it extra, extra clear why that isn't the case. So instead of just hmm. saying that, oh, we didn't find that, you have to dive into that and make really convince the client that what they thought wasn't true, um, was true, wasn't true. And typically you do that by first showing them something from the data that they um, that makes sense to everybody. So this the data shows this, our algorithms show this, and everybody sort of agrees on that. And then you can show, well, but we didn't see this. So that the client sees the algorithm seem to be correct, that they have that um, confidence in it. And then you can show them, well, not everything we thought would happen is actually happening because blah, blah, blah. Instead of I, just showing them immediately, this is not true. <laughs> what, what I love about you is that you have like this, obviously this very uh, analytical coding side 
but then you also have this very artistic creative side um, and it's very unique to find individuals like you and i love the fact that you you said that you go to pinterest to kind of just kind of get the creative juices flowing start to think about different ways to present data uh, so is your pinterest board is your pinterest account is it public that other people could check out yeah yeah definitely yeah i i also follow other people so all for sharing Okay, cool. So what I'll do is I'll put this URL on the screen. Um, let's see here. Here we go. So uh, for those listening to the podcast, the URL that will redirect over to Nadi's Pinterest account will be ex.pn slash Nadi Pin. And that's spelled N-A-D-I-E-H-P-I-N. And that'll bring you over to her Pinterest account for you to check out. Uh, to get those creative uses flowing. I think that'll be helpful for other other data scientists that are looking for data visualizations. Very cool. So um yeah, I love I love this like hearing like your your uh process. Can you share with us maybe some favorite examples of data visualizations you worked on? Uh yeah, first I think one of my favorite ones of recently was a, a big project I did together with the uh, Guardian called Bust Out. And it was about homeless people. They get um, the the Guardian had already uh, found out that uh, homeless people were being sent to other places with a one way bus ticket, but nobody really had investigated what happens to these homeless people once they reach oh. the other other side. Um, so they requested all kinds of data from the different bus programs in in states from the Freedom of Information Act. And then I was asked, and I brought in Shirley Wu, who I've been collaborating with a lot um, to tackle the data analysis side. And th this was a special case in that, but also then create the visual elements to help with the, the journalistic story. I quite like that one just because of the impact of the story is showing people that this is a thing that's happening and mm -hmm. that it's sometimes it works, but more often than not, it actually doesn't work. Um, so that's why I like that one. And I think another recent, well, recent favorite is um, I like to do visualizations about things I'm in my personal time about things I'm very uh, crazy about. And this was <laughs> <laughs> this was a card capture Sakura. I don't know if you if you Wait, know what? it. Wait, what? Card capture Sakura. I, I probably say that wrong. It's a manga, uh, so a Japanese comic in a way. And oh. I read that during I read that during my teens, and now they started up a new a new arc in a way. So I was completely into that, and I wanted to just visualize visualize the um, the things I read during my during my youth. So I made a gigantic visualization about all the chapters and the characters, and I, I investigated the main colors from the um, from the covers of each chapter and so on. It became quite big, and it's it's such a thing for a niche market in a way there's not even a market there's just a few people who are as crazy about it as i am and they love it and i'm, I'm fine i'm happy with that <laughs> alex says i love that show oh great I, I, i'm totally out of it i totally did not yeah i've not followed that but i, I is this on your blog by the way yes it is oh no it's not on my blog but it's in my portfolio and it's uh, you can find it on data sketches uh the, oh okay okay it's part of that project yeah Okay, cool. Uh, I'll make sure to put a link in the comments of the Facebook video as well as in the YouTube video so people can go check it out. Mm -hmm. um, which reminds me, uh, you have um, this amazing uh, portfolio. You did a um, a presentation a while back. Was it like a year ago? Um, hacking the visual norm. Mm -hmm. You gave a talk in Amsterdam and you had a beautiful slide deck on GitHub, uh, exactly. can you talk a little bit about that presentation? Because it was beautiful what you, what you produced. Thank you. Um, yes, so it was not your normal presentation. It was all programmed in a way. So every slide was its own HTML um, web page in a way, and I used Reveal.js to then have a beautiful way to sort of flip through each web page as if it was a presentation. But I knew pretty when I. So the first time I was going to speak at an international conference, I knew I wanted to do something special and I wanted to show my visualizations in a way that best represented them. And I also wanted to be able to interact with them. So I knew videos were not going to work. And after uh, searching around a little bit, I found Reveal.js uh, that lets you that lets you make this presentation build out of slides. But uh, 
sorry, websites. And because all of my visualizations are built up of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, I could sort of make the visualizations work inside of the slide. So I can interact with the visualizations on the slides, but I can also make it animate. So I can mm. press like the next button and then all of the circles move from one side to the other side, because that's more sort of as if you're um, triggering an event listener in a way that does a click, for example. Um, so I, I made this, this slide deck in a way, it took me a month and a half of all my free hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it really fast. Uh, but yeah, it, it was very well uh, received. So I was, I was truly, truly uh, very happy about that. And, yeah. and what was one of your goals with that presentation? I mean, you call, call you called it hacking the visual norm. What was kind of like one of your key messages to the data scientists and artists out there? that you should really try and do that extra, extra step to take the visualization beyond the default settings because every data set is unique and has its own you know, quirks that require adjustments to a default like, uh, layout that you might have chosen or a chart form that you might have chosen to make it even more impactful or even more effective for your audience. So this could be choosing a better color palette or um, really thinking about the chart form. So instead of going straight for the bar or line chart, looking at what other people have done and maybe going for a bubble chart or a force layout. So something really just not being, not being satisfied with just plugging your data into a, an example and then being that's done. You worked on a project uh, that I was reading about on your blog with Zan Armstrong. Mm -hmm. uh, this was for the baby spike data visualization that you did for Scientific American Magazine. Mm -hmm. What was it like partnering up with Zan? And can you talk about a little bit about that process? Uh, that was that was super. It was great because Zan. It was they actually asked Zan because she had um, already talked about this um, seasonal trend that happens when babies are born. So it's not just average. There are trends throughout the day, throughout the year. And then Zan asked me to help with her on the visual side, and I just happened to be in the US for three weeks when the time was about when we were supposed to be creating it. Um, so we we had two sort of half day blocks where we were together and we really investigated the data. First figuring out what is the, the angle of the story that we wanna tell uh, and then making a rough design for the uh, for the visual side, but because she really did the data part, so she had found the data, she had processed the data, uh, and made some plots in R and everything, and then uh, then I took it more towards the um, coding that up in D3 and Illustrator, and then finishing the finishing the things up. But the, just the fact that we we could go, I could go back and forth with her, so I would have an idea, and I would throw it at her, and she'd tell me yes or no, or what her thoughts were, and 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 vice versa. And I think that was what really get it, made it go to that extra level mm -hmm. uh, because it's just too, sometimes you can get so get stuck in your, in your own thinking that you're not seeing that there could be a better way or what you think is obvious isn't obvious to somebody else. So I, I guess it makes a lot of fun to be able to, uh, to work together. And how did you end up deciding on that, that particular visual? And I don't know if it's possible in podcast form to relay this visualization, but how would you describe it and how did you come up with that baby spike yeah. image? All right, so the baby, the baby spike sh is all about deviations from the defaults, from the average, sorry, so from the average uh, number of babies born. We wanted to show that, especially on a daily basis, that you have a gigantic spike of babies being born around 8 a.m. due to C-sections. Uh, but there are more nuanced things. So the, the visualization is in a circle because it's it's time, and therefore we show a day and a and a week and a year, and they all are circular. So we we have sort of like a, a line chart going around a circle, but instead of the base being zero, the base is the average value. That means that if the line dips below the base, it the the stuff between the the I'm hoping make explain this sort of clear. It's very <laughs> hard. It's very hard. <laughs> yeah. That's why we have visualizations, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the stuff between the average and the lower than average is filled in with blue, and if it's above average, the stuff between the average line and the the height above the average line is filled in with red. 
uh, but it's like in a very journalistic way. So it you can if you see the circular chart, you can immediately see oh that that's when less babies than average were born. That's when way more babies than average were born. Uh, so that's sort of the general visual side. And we we decided on that. Well, the circular thing came because of the um, the fact that it's the day is, is circular so you really want to connect the ends back together because there could be a trend going over that that happens during midnight and if you just fold it out it's they seem to be very far away whereas they're actually not and then the average line doing that 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 red reddish uh, bluish thing that came because we had um, at the start we'd figured out that the goal of this visualization is to show the the deviation from the average. So the average should be very prominent in some way. And we, well, of course, when we started out making visuals in R, we had set the baseline to zero and we started out with just straight straight line plots. But by just by playing around and having that goal in our mind, we eventually came to this idea with the circular, with the, the base being the average line. And for those that are listening to the podcast or those watching the video, um... Afterward, after this is live, uh, the URL to check out the baby spike, I'm going to create this redirect right after this video show, is <laughs> ex.pn slash baby spike. That'll bring you over to Scientific America, where you can actually see what Nadi just explained. It's so difficult to explain, but you did a very good job. Um, very, very insightful to hear that. And uh, and I love how you're so detailed with like the color choices and the the color scheme and all that. And all that. So um, you mentioned also in a blog post, I wanted to ask you, because uh, I love when you write about art and the, your, the creative process. And you said that, um, I, think, I think it was during the baby spike design, you said that you did something and sometimes you said that sometimes the design just doesn't feel right. And how one version of your data visualization felt too polished. And I wonder if you can kind of talk through that what that means. Yeah, it's it's something that comes completely from the creative side that I have no, I, I can't put it into some sort of objective number or a statement, but I look at it and I feel that it's just not right. It's, and for this case, I had filled the, um, so the area below and above the average, I'd filled them with gradients. So say from, um, from light reddish orange to dark, dark red. Uh, and I was looking at it. It was just too. It was too. It looked too perfect uh, because SVGs, the the things that I create my visualizations, and they are you know they're super super sharp, no matter how big or small you make them, because uh, yeah, they're not fixed to pixels, but they're really um, shapes. And it, I I can't even explain the why, but it was just <laughs> it was just not good enough. I felt that there was a better way to do this, that to, to give it a little bit more, um, how do you say that, depth in a way than these two perfect shapes of blue gradients and red gradients. And uh, sometimes I have the feeling and I am unable to find the solution. And sometimes I have the feeling and I just keep on trying or experimenting with different things. And then I do find something that works better. And then I can say, yes, this is, this is much better. And I'm, I'm happy with this. But I, I yeah, there's no I can't I wish I could say that there was a formula that I could use to say yeah. this is not <laughs> this is well, well it's it's great because it's like it's your artistic side. It's like what you feel, right, as you're working. And you're balancing like your data side, your analytical mind with like your artistic side and mm -hmm. there's a battle going on, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what would you, what what would you say is like some of the most challenging work? for anybody who works in data visualizations and and in that in those challenges what kind of keeps you motivated to keep pushing forward there i'd say there are two main challenging challenges the first one is figuring out this abstract design so not looking at colors but just how am i going to lay out my data is it going to be circles or curly shapes and how and so this is very abstract design that's the first challenge. The second challenge is just uh, browsers and mobile versus desktop. And the fact that you almost have to make two visualizations, <laughs> one that works on a, on a white screen, one that works on a teeny tiny screen. And then there's uh, you know, some things that work in Chrome that don't work in Safari or 
you have some sometimes <laughs> even IE has to be able made able to work in these. The last thing I can say that that's not actually something I enjoy that much because it has nothing to do really with the visual side where I get most of my enjoyment from. It's just the the technical side. So this is uh, it's more that I can do the visual side that I'm fine with picking up all of these browser book thingies and mobile and desktop thingies that keep me going. Um, and for the design, I guess it's just a challenge. The idea that you are trying to make something and that eventually you are happy with what you've made, that people are actually understanding the data uh, better through what I've made. And they, they can also say, oh, this looks this looks intriguing. And I can also understand what is it, the main points and they can find their own. I, I like visualizing lots of data where there is one main story, but people can play with it or look at it more deeply and then find other stories that they might be interested in. So when I when I just that, that idea that that satisfaction that you can get from having done your job well. No doubt. Do, do you have any favorite tools you like to use uh, when developing these data visualizations? Yes. So for data analysis and preparation R, I use a lot of R. And then I go into I start using D3, which is a JavaScript library. But I um, I use Visual Studio to program to program in, not Visual Studio. No, wait, wait. I, I always say this wrong. Visual Code. Damn it. <laughs> it's, no worries. It's, yeah, it's the one that it's the smaller one, not the actual VBA one from Microsoft. So it's it's uh, sort of uh, something with Visual Studio Code in mind is one of those two second words. Uh, it works on a Mac and it's really it's really easy. Uh, and not overly full of, of options, but just the right things I need for more of a front end programmer. Um, I I need to use all of my all of the web browsers, of course, but I prefer Chrome. And then I use Illustrator because some clients also want their visualizations to be turned into a poster or a static thing. So I take um, the New York Times has developed a uh, a small tool called SVG Crowbar. Uh, well, it's sort of a link from uh, that you can put into your Chrome uh, Chrome extensions in a way. Uh, you click it and then it downloads an SVG of the visualization I've made in the browser. And then I can open it up in Illustrator and I have, I always have to make adjustments because not all of the settings go through, but at least the most important ones go through. Uh, so those are, I think so those are my three, three main things. So R, D3 in Visual Studio and Illustrator. Awesome. And for those that are listening to the podcast, um, and want to get those tools, we'll make sure to put them up on our Experian blog. And the short URL for that is ex.pn slash N-A-D-I-E-H. And that will have a, under the resources section of that blog post. So you can check it out. Uh, that was very, very helpful. Nadia, thank you so much. Um, so one, one last question, and that is that uh, poor data visualizations can not only hurt our eyes, but they can also, even worse, tell an incorrect story. So um, can you kind of share what types of data visualizations mistakes bother you? Like, for instance, when you're looking at the paper or you're looking at a website, I'm kind of curious, like, what are some of your pet peeves? Well, the, the most obvious one I, I think that comes very often is the bar charts not starting at zero because you're just blatantly sort of lying uh, in a visual mm -hmm. way. But maybe more nuanced and small things. Um, I I personally don't like it when I see a default color palette. So, for example, Tableau or ClickView have default default palettes, and uh, when I see that, I feel people have not paid attention to the data. They just plugged it in and then moved on. Mm. Uh, but other things in terms of lying with the data, it's using the wrong chart form. Like time series data that is continuous should be in a line and not a bar chart because it's not discrete, these kind of uh, uh, smaller things. Uh, but I guess pie charts with too many slices <laughs> <laughs> or pie charts in general, maybe. <laughs> well, I always hear from data visualization uh, artists, they really dis despise the pie chart. Yeah, it's, I don't think I've ever used it. I've, I've gone for maybe <laughs> a donut chart once, but never a pie chart. It's. I guess it's it's more than in the in the way that uh, just don't use a pie chart until you know the <laughs> rules well enough that you know when to break them. So it's it's a little bit nuanced to that. But if you just not feel that comfortable, just pick something else than a pie chart. Uh, uh, but it's 
the thing is, it's just difficult for people to see the angles. They're much better if they see that in either a stacked bar chart or a normal bar chart. That's much better for people to see. So even with the pie chart, you could be slightly, uh, how do you say that, uh, deceiving your audience, and especially with 3D. So these, are, do you know in Excel, there's this 3D cone chart? That's just, okay. that's just the plain awful. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, I, I was looking up some, uh, looking up for an, uh, a vacation, the weather in a city that I was yeah. going to, and they put it into a 3D cone chart com comparing the city to another city in that country. And yeah. I was just like, this, I can't, I can't <laughs> even see if this, if the temperature in one city is bigger than the other because they're in this weird 3D shape. <laughs> I feel like have these people even looked at this chart? How? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yeah, it's just 3D has you no know, 3D without adding extra information is just is just gets on my nerves. But it looks so cool, Nadi. <laughs> oh, 3D God. is just where it's at. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, I just, no, don't listen to me. I, <laughs> I'm just exploring with my 2D flat. Flatland. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, after this conversation, I'm never going to do a pie chart ever again. I'm scared about using That's a good. pie chart. <laughs> That's good. Get the entire database community on you. <laughs> yes, yes. Going to send you an email. Nadi, is this okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, anyways, uh, we're at the end of our uh, time here. So, just a couple quick questions. Um, what is your favorite programming language and why? R, R, be yes, because it's. I really like the the fact that you can run certain sections. You don't have to compile everything. You can run something and then run a line all the way at the top, and then run lines that are way at the bottom. And there are packages to do practically anything. Anything. Mm -hmm. Somebody has made a package for it in R, so uh, that's why I like it a lot. It's. It gives me the fewest headaches. The second last and last question is, what advice do you have for people that are interested in getting started in data science? Mm -hmm. Be curious um, and be able to know that you have to probably invest the time in, invest your own time into getting to a good level, especially these days with data science being so uh, there's so many people in it that you are you should not expect that you will learn enough on the job you might it be take on that course on the side i know it's hard but try and get your level to a better place and try and do that by doing these kinds of personal projects pick a question that motivates you yourself that you are curious about and then try and find an answer through that by through data science figuring out what algorithm to use to actually get an answer to your to that question you want to do and for each it, it helps you because it both you both learn something that you always wanted to know for example uh and your skills get better and you can use those skills in a, a business environment later on but uh, it's also good because you can build up a portfolio which i think might be interesting also for data scientists to be able to show that they have a small portfolio of um data science related questions that they solved and how they solved it, that they can show during, for example, a, um, a job interview that they, and it's not just portfolios for, for visual things. You can also have portfolios for skills instead of just saying that you can do R and Python showing that you can do it. That's great advice. Great advice. Uh, well, Nadi, thank you so much for being our guest. Uh, where can everyone learn more about you? I have a website called visualcinnamon.com uh, because the, as you already sort of figured out, my name is impossible to spell. So I try <laughs> to find, find something that people find more easy to spell. So visualcinnamon.com. I'm also very active on Twitter where it's uh, Nadi Brewer and also on Instagram, same, same handle there. Wonderful. We'll make sure to put links in the YouTube about section as well as in the comments of this Facebook video. And for anybody who's listening to on the podcast, they can go over to ex.pn slash Nadi, spelled N-A-D-I-E-H, and I will provide links to all of her social handles, including the work that she's doing on GitHub, so you can follow her there as well. Nadi, thank you so much for sharing your insights with our community. It's been a blast chatting with you. So much fun. And um, all the way over there in Amsterdam, I'm here in uh, Costa Mesa, California. Thank you so much for your time. 
and looking forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, see you, see you around maybe. Yeah, take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs>